is one God. He is King. Yes. He is Lord. Amen. 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 Those things that you feel are overwhelming you, He is Lord to the end. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Just a reminder before we start this morning, kids, you have sermon note pages today. Them, they said, use them. Parents help the kids use them. And then at the end of the service, don't forget to pick up devotions and life book at the close of the service. Praise the Lord. We are getting into the Word this morning. I trust that you brought your Bibles. series is raising, rising above the ruins. Rising above the ruins. Now, you can possibly find more times when they were ruins in the Bible, <laughs> but I have chosen these three to believe that God he wants to speak to us specifically through these. Now, at other times we will revisit, particularly Ezra and Nehemiah. But today we want to look at Nehemiah. And we're going to cover the entire book of Nehemiah in one session. This is a challenge <laughs> because there was so much that I wanted to grab on. But I think we're familiar somewhat with Nehemiah and what he tells us. Obviously, open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. That's a good place to begin. Now, when we looked at Josiah, we saw that the end and the what happened through Josiah's ministry, his kingship, his reign, was that he brought about a revival in Israel, bringing people back to God and to his word. Ezra, we saw that what happened with Ezra is there was a bringing back of people also to the word of God, to the law of God, to the altar of God, and to the temple of God. There was a return to these, and those resulted in a revival in Judah. Now I have revival in my heart. I long for the day of revival. But here we have Nehemiah. He comes, and Nehemiah comes, and he doesn't come to establish the Word of God in Judah, in Jerusalem, but he comes to set up a standard of maintaining revival. And so, rising above the ruins as Nehemiah and the people that were with him build the walls of Jerusalem, I want you to think of this in terms of protecting, defending, re re um, upholding, and maintaining the revival that has come to Jerusalem. It's in the year 586 before Christ, that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonian armies. The great temple was burned to the ground. The protective walls were reduced to rubble. And after the Persian Empire conquers Babylon, a new king comes to be. But God continually was working behind the scenes. Israel had found themselves, or Judah had found itself in captivity. Why were they in captivity? Do you remember why they were sent to captivity? Disobedience. Disobedience? Because 
because they continued to rebel against the word of the Lord. God sent prophet after prophet. He had warned them time and time again and said, if you do not repent and turn from your wicked ways, if you do not abandon the idols, then this will happen to you. Not only did God tell them this through prophets in their time, God had warned them way back in Deuteronomy that there was a way to receive the blessings of God and there was a way to walk in what Deuteronomy, depending on the, the version you read, what, what is to walk in a curse. Now, we don't like to think of that, but go read Deuteronomy 28 and then tell me what it says. There's a way to walk in the promises of God, and there's a way to walk in the blessings of God, and there is a way that you, you or I or somebody will walk in what we might term curses. Now, Jesus has come to lift the curse of the law but not the consequence of our bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Not the consequence of our sin as we walk and deliberately walk in it. Yes, he has come to deliver us from, if we will come to him, yes, he has come to save our souls. The penalty of sin he took upon himself, but the consequence of our misdeeds may yet come to us if we walk in rebel. Okay. So, let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36. You just take this reference down. 36, 22 to 23. This is what God is, says behind the scenes here. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to the proclamation in writing and sent it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord God, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for this task, and may the Lord your God be with you. And even ruler doing God's bidding. Mm -hmm. God certainly is in control. Over the next hundred years, three companies of people returned to Jerusalem with the dream of having Jerusalem rebuilt to rise up from those ruins. Zerubbabel was first, then Ezra, and then finally Nehemiah comes. And through this series, we're seeing how we're seeing how men of God, godly men, respond in times of great distress and difficulty. So in Nehemiah, back to Nehemiah chapter one, first four verses, we see Nehemiah asks his brother, who has returned from Judah, he comes back and he asks him, he says, "Well." How are things back home? Now that's something that that we ask a lot of you who have family or somebody who lives far away. You may ask when they come, well, how are things back there? Mm -hmm. And the reply comes in verse 3. Things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. How does Nehemiah respond to this? I think there's a correlation. The walls. on that. But there's a, those things that defend the faith in the 
this land are in ruins. Mm -hmm. The gates are burnt with fire and the walls are in ruins. And as long as this is so, the temple is at great risk. Number four, verse four says, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. That should be the state of the church in this land. That should right. be our heart at this time. Mm -hmm. We'll be continually wait, fast, mourn, pray to the God of heaven. Now the first thing that Nehemiah didn't do was he did not pretend that it was no big deal. Mm -hmm. He did not pretend that he didn't feel anything about it. In fact, Nehemiah is unlike most of us. He went into an emotional state mm -hmm. over the condition of Jerusalem. Nehemiah is not much like me, or I'm not much <laughs> like you. He lets grief take a hold of him and come to the surface. But he doesn't just let it, let it be there as grief. He's not just a mess. Under grief, he begins to put grief to work. He begins to put this grief to action. Yes, he wept for four days. I mean, he put it on. When I mean, last did you wept for four days over anything? He wept for four days. See, in our hard time and our suffering, we have to stop long enough to mourn. Have we mourned yet over what we have lost? Perhaps we don't know. We don't know the condition of Jerusalem because we have not acquired. Perhaps we do not know the condition of our country, of our nation. There are forces in this nation that are tearing at the gates of our city. They are tearing down our walls and they have left them in ruins. And as we come and we face an election, there has never been a more important time to understand what is at stake. Now I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I am going to say be aware that it is important for us to stand and hear from God because there is one side who wants to take away our walls and our gates and wants to leave us in a state of ruin where, where the next thing that will fall is the altar, the faith that is within us. We are under siege and we need to understand it, but we must come to a place where we will mourn what has already been taken yes. so that we understand what is at risk. Yes. We are living in very dangerous times. Mm -hmm. But Nehemiah made no pretense of the situation that he was facing. He went to prayer. Mm -hmm. He mourned and he turned his grief to prayer. He turned his grief to, to a time when he began to seek God. You see, it does, not, it does not help just to be sad over something, to be worried about something that is lost. It is not enough just to come to the point of grief. We can be in grief over the state of our nation, but we have to turn that grief to prayer. Yes. And we have to go to God and say, God, what would you have me do? How? Would you have me step up in this nation and in this land? But Nehemiah didn't try to handle it alone. He didn't just, well, I'm going to take the a one army, one man army. No, he took it to God. He went to prayer. And, and his prayer was pretty serious. He replaced eating with prayer. He fasted. He replaced eating. Now, now we all like to eat. But 
Nehemiah was in such distress that he cut the ear and took the time to pray. And in that, he found the grace to discover that God's grace and God's mercy is sufficient. See, after Nehemiah prayed, and, and I think because he prayed, because he had inquired of God, because he sought the Lord, he made a plan. He had a plan coming out of prayer. He didn't come out, he didn't have a plan coming out of grief. He didn't come, have a plan coming out of you receiving the information. He had a plan out of prayer. And we have, we have one of two choices when we are laid a great burden on us, when we, we receive a great burden, when we look and we survey our land and we say, God, what is happening? We can have a great burden for our land, but we have to go to prayer. And when we do, we will come out of that prayer. And we will either just ignore it or we'll roll, roll up our sleeves and say, it's time to build. It's time to rebuild. It's time to establish again the walls that surround Jerusalem. We can get busy or we can just move on by ourselves. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 says that when they arrived in Jerusalem, I told you we're skipping through quite fast. When they arrived in Jerusalem, he did a midnight tour. Now, this is a fascinating portion to read. Go and read it. Please do read the book of Nehemiah this week. But, but he took this tour, a midnight tour of the city. He carefully surveyed the conditions of the rooms. I mean, they were, they were pretty bad. They, it was a horrible sight to observe. And he, he went and looked at this at midnight. And when he was done, God had given him a plan. A plan to rebuild. The next day, he got the leaders together and he shared his vision for rebuilding the walls. And he shared it in such a way. There's not a lot of detail in what he, in how he did, but they bought in. They were with him. That's a challenge. To have people be with the plan of God. Verse 17 through 18 tells us in chapter 2, tells us the next day he got leaders and he shared this vision. Verse 18 is from Nehemiah's personal journal. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me. And what the king had said to me, they said, let's start building. And they were encouraged to do this good work. Church, let's start building. The defenses of our faith on every side. Nehemiah 3 lays out Nehemiah's plan of action. He assigns work teams at ten different gates, each tackling their part of the whole project. He divides them up. He says, you do this piece, you do this. And he sent them to build, and they all built together on the same plan, side by side. And I love this part here. It says, chapter 4, verse 6, tells of the determination and the unity of the people. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had the will to keep working. Now, now halfway can be very discouraging. Mm -hmm. We have to read further. They didn't stop at half. They didn't stop at half. They kept going. And you see, amazing progress was made but they kept going. And in 52 days, they rebuilt those walls. I mean, that, that was an amazing 
feet. That was incredible work. That was quick. He didn't have that many people working with him, and his building materials were, was stolen, and much of it was rubble from the broken down walls. Was it difficult? Oh yeah, it was difficult. Did everybody work together? Well, kind of. It says there what you read, Pastor. But if you read the chapter yourself, you'll find that they did not all work together. Right. Just like it happens everywhere today. You see, there were those who who, who were working and those who were watching work. My dad always used to say, not that this was his way of life anyway, he says, I love work. I can watch it for hours. <laughs> you might say that, but you better be a worker. Mm -hmm. Watch your own hands and be at work, not somebody else's. You see, most of them kept the focus on the story of what had been brewing. The rubble around us today can be very discouraging. And finding our way to help can be challenging. And frankly, it can be tiring. But we are the church. We are God's people. We can pray, and we should. And in fact, we should not get to work until we've prayed. But when we pray, we should get to work. Together with God, we can accomplish much in our days. There are so many voices that are saying, we're done, we're fried, we, it's, it's over. And fear is coming in like the walls falling in on so many. But I want to tell you that it is not over until God says it is over. And when God declares it's over, he declares victory, not ruin. Mm -hmm. God declares victory, not ruin. That's right. So it's time for the church to stand up and be bold in this day. Chapter 4, they face much opposition and mocking. And um, there's two guys, Sandal and Tobiah, they, they are something else. But go read about them in verse 40, it says... But don't be afraid of the enemy. Come on. Let's not be afraid of the enemy. It's fine to recognize that there is an enemy, but do not be afraid of the enemy. Right. Remember the Lord who is great mm -hmm. and glorious. Yes. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Remember the Lord and fight for your brothers, mm -hmm. your sons, and your daughters, your yeah. wives, and your homes. Mm -hmm. There's much at stake. Mm -hmm. Somebody once said to me on Facebook, why is it that Christians always talk about fighting? <laughs> the moment we quit, we give the enemy an opportunity. Mm -hmm. There is no appeasing the enemy. There is only winning victory after victory mm -hmm. over him. Mm -hmm. You have to <clears throat> see what Nehemiah does in chapter, we're going to um, chapters 8 to 10 right now. Exactly <coughs> now. I told you. It's the only way we can get through. Nehemiah understood how they got their ruined city. It was not the Babylonians. Yes, the Babylonians invaded them. It was not the Medes or the Persians. Yes, the Medes and Persians invaded Babylon and took over the kingdom of Babylon. But it was not them. It was their rebellion against God. Now, so often we, we can come to the place where we will, we, will, we will blame the devil for what's happening in our life. We made choices. And we're reaping the consequence of those choices. And it's not for us to tell us how all the devils out. Is it? It's 
sometimes we need to recognize our rebellion mm -hmm. and our need for repentance. Mm -hmm. And when we walk away from God's principles and God's word, we choose to do things our own way. Mm -hmm. Or we try to find another solution other than what God prescribes. And then we are walking in rebellion. Mm -hmm. And we will reap consequences that are contrary to God's blessings. Mm -hmm. And there's no point to turn around and say, oh, the devil's at me. He's having a field day because he's getting what he wants without him having to do a single thing. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is repent of those times. Mm -hmm. I read a story. A man goes out and buys a wonderful, beautiful talking parrot. It's a, it's a beautiful bird. It's remarkable. Its language skills are to be praised, except for one thing. Not only does the bird have good language skills, it actually has bad language skills. It curses and swears. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to say sailors do it. Because that uh, would be bad on sailors. But, but this bird had no filter. And of course, when neighbors came around or friends came to visit, this bird was a great embarrassment to this man. He loved the bird for its novelty, for its beauty, and sometimes it would actually, he could be proud of the way it but much of the time, he wished that it would control its language. One day, he finally had enough of this bird running off its mouth the way it did. And he picked it up, and he shook it, and it just went worse and worse. So he grabbed it, and he stuck it in the freezer and shut the lid. And first, the bird swore and went crazy in the freezer. Over and over and over again, he did a flood. And eventually, after some time, it got quiet. And he waited for a little while longer. You guys will say, oh, that animal cruelty. <laughs> it was quiet. He waited a little longer. And then he decided, well, let me look. And as he envisioned opening the freezer and finding a frozen parrot, opened the lid. There the parrot quickly climbed out onto his outstretched arm and quietly said, I'm really, really sorry about the trouble I've, trouble I've been causing you. I made a solemn promise to clean up my language from now on. Of course he was surprised. What on earth had happened? But the parrot helped clear up the question very soon. The parrot said, I have a question. What on earth did the chicken envision? <laughs> <laughs> Listen very carefully. The people in Nehemiah's day, they had hard times. They had painful losses and deep hurts. They were a spiritual wake up call. They didn't just come and find themselves in a string of bad luck. They had known, they knew that where they were was because of their rebellion. They were in exile. Jerusalem was in ruins because they refused to hear the word of the Lord over and over again. God had thrown them in the freezer to get their attention. They realized their severe difficulties were God's severe mercy. God was calling them to holiness and to return to Him. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 36, we read these chilling words. So now, today, we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. And we are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They have power over us and our 
our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure. And we are in great misery. When we do not stick to the principles and instructions of God's word, this is what happens. Nehemiah 10 goes on to tell us that these people made four promises. And actually, this is, a, this is the bulk of my message. It took me a lot of time to get here. These four pledges of promises that they made. See, this is how we retain and keep the Bible. How? First, is, first one is chapter 10, verse 28 to 29. I'm just taking um, a part of that. We have to submit to God's word, to God's law. We have to get in and know God's word. And Brenda heard this this morning. We'll hear it over and over again. Everyone who is able to understand and who has separated themselves from the surrounding people to obey the law of God, join with their noble brothers and commit themselves with a sworn oath to follow the law of God given through God's servant Moses and to carefully obey all the commands and ordinances and statutes of the law. Of the law. oath to follow the word of the Lord. Hmm. If I made a solemn oath to do anything, that would put a great burden on me to actually do it. I mean, if I, if I went and, and, and made a psalm of, it would mean that I would, I would put everything at my disposal to do this thing. Any of you ever keep your promise? <laughs> or hope to die? <laughs> Crossing my heart, hope to die? <laughs> we all did. But did we actually mean it? And put our lives on the line for it. No. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. Right? right? But when these people made the solemn promise, they put their lives, they put their future, they put their, their blessings at stake. <coughs> the people are saying, and they are seriously submitting to God's word. They are willing to say, Lord, if we do not do this thing, then the curses of Deuteronomy 28, let them be upon us. Let them come upon us if we do not do the things of your word. That's how serious they got. See, it's one thing to have revival, to have the blessing of God, to have the jump up and down and elation and happiness that comes. But it's another thing when that comes and we have to maintain it, we have to hold on to it, we have to get a grip in our lives and say, we will not let go. Mm -hmm. I make a solemn pledge to the word of God. That if I do not keep and hold to the things of God's word, may it be so. That the consequences of walking in disobedience, may they come upon me. Now that goes a step further than any of us are probably willing to go. That is a confession. That's the kind of serious nature that we need to take. Let's pledge to the Word of God. Now, I'm not going to make you make that kind of pledge, but I want you to understand that these are serious things. Mm -hmm. Let's make a pledge to God's Word. Because when we do, if we do, and we live by the Word of God, the blessings of God will be upon us. The Word of God is clear. You will not have to watch out, watch your back for the curses. Yes, 
the enemy will be there, but God will be there first. Right. Because he said, I will never leave you. Mm -hmm. I will never forsake you. And God always keeps his word. Mm -hmm. The second pledge they made was to be separate from the world. Nehemiah 10 verse 30, we will not give our daughters in marriage to the surrounding peoples, and we will not take their daughters as wives for our sons. This was a major pitfall for Israel throughout all the years that Israel has been. Because every time they broke this law, this pivotal law, they invited idolatry. Tell you, young people, kids, those of you who are not married, do not hunt among the Philistines. You must find somebody among God's people. Yes. Do not go to the world and look upon theirs. Wives, those women, or those men, and say, I will have one of those for myself. Mm -hmm. They will lead you astray. Mm -hmm. Not because they are bad, but because they do not know God. Mm -hmm. And that still remains the principle. Do not compromise on God's principles. Mm -hmm. God wants his people to be radically different. This is what it means. Be radically different, uncompromised, uncompromising in our values and undivided in our loyalties toward God. You think that's an Old Testament thing? You think I'm just being legalistic? Well, let's pick on, let's go to, to Brother Paul and see if he agrees. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 16. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does God's sanctuary have with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living God. It's not legalistic. It's Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it is black and white. Yes. It is clear. It's one or the other. There is no in between. See, we often undermine the commitment here to be radically different, thinking that there's some legalistic, old-fashioned thing that we have graduated from as a church. Yeah. The reason we have graduated from this is the reason we find ourselves in the trouble we are today. See, someone said it's not a ship that's in the water that makes it sink. But it's the water in the ship mm -hmm. that makes it sink. Mm -hmm. It's not the Christian in the world, but the world that's in the Christian that constitutes danger. How much evidence is there that I'm a Christian? Can I find enough evidence at home, at work? Can I find it? Has there been a Holy Spirit change in your life that touches your speech, your habits, your choices, your values? I pray that they would be. After pledging themselves to submit to God's word and to live separate lives, God's people made a third pledge. And this is an interesting one. This one we 
we try to ignore as well. They pledged to the Sabbath day. Nehemiah 10, verse 31. And when the surrounding people bring merchandise of any kind of grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. We will also leave the land uncultivated in the seventh year and will cancel every debt. Now, there's, there's a lot in there. You can go look in the law. But they kept the Sabbath principle in its entirety. The word Sabbath means to cease, to stop working, to celebrate, or to be finished. God instituted the Sabbath day as a day of the week to set a godly rhythm into the calendar, into our week. And in the New Testament, this goes beyond just observing a day. This is a choice that we need to apply to any day of the week. In fact, it goes beyond a choice. It's a command. It's an instruction of God that we do this. Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man in Mark chapter 2, 27. Now, resting is important. I don't do a good job at resting. I really don't. So as I prepared this, I felt a contradiction in my own heart. I said, God, what am I preaching today? But let it not be a contradiction in our hearts. Let us set aside the day of the Lord for first things. We have a day we set aside for the things of God. But let's not get involved in all kinds of market activity mm -hmm. on this day. Let us make it our priority to be in the gathering of the saints, with the saints, in praise of God. Let's make that our standard. But it also means that we have to take pause and rest. Mm -hmm. See, it's easy right now when there are so many things that are left undone to work right through times of rest, mm -hmm. to be driven, to produce, to make things happen. Now, in, in, in my life, the work never is done. It's just never. There's, there's always, in this there's always another thing to do. I don't know what it's like for you, but it was kind of interesting the days when I worked for someone out there was that I could walk out and turn the key in the lock. And I didn't have to think about it until Monday morning. But I never will. So this is the great challenge for me. But how is God challenging you in the matters of taking rest and pause? And it's not for it's not for recreation, recreation. It's not for for well, I have to take rest so that I can I can just get into all my hobbies and all kinds of things. There is a place for that, but it's to take a pause for God. It's to take a moment for God. Could we pledge to frequent times? Time out for God. Not from Him, but for Him. The Sabbath day was not to take a time away from God, but it was to take a time to focus on God because actually you will not find rest outside of Him. It's true. You won't. Okay, last one. I'll be quick. They made a pledge to support God's work. Nehemiah chapter 10, 32 to 39. The phrase here, the house of God, is used nine times. And it refers to the temple, which had been already rebuilt. You see, in rebuilding Jerusalem and establishing the walls, they had to make a commitment to maintenance. They had to make a commitment to, to what was established, what was put in place, that that would remain. So Nehemiah chapter 10, 32 to 33 says, we will impose the following commandments on ourselves to give an eighth of an ounce of silver yearly for the service 
of the house of God, the bread dis displayed before the Lord, the daily grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbath and the new moon offerings, the appointed festivals, the holy things, the sin offerings to retain for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. They pledged to do all the offerings to bring their first fruits, the best of their harvest, to bring their tithes to the house of the Lord. So Nehemiah 10, 39 sums it up. We will not neglect the house of God in this matter. Some context. They had not yet built their houses. They had arrived and they built the walls of Jerusalem. They had not built for themselves houses this point. You see, at this point, before they had anything in their own hands, before anything was really established, they made a commitment to give to God first, systematically and sacrificially. It's there. They put it on the calendar. They set it up. This is how it was going to be. So four pledges they made Submission to God's word, separation from the world, taking a Sabbath rest, and to support God's work. These were solemn pledges. We're not likely to make those same kind of pledges today, but I want you to think about it as I am. What pledge, solemn pledge, would I make? Will I, could I put my name to these four pledges and say, yes, I shall do it. Because this is how we walk in victory. If it begins, mm -hmm. let's get into the word. Mm -hmm. Actually, if we get into the word, everything else will follow. All of these principles are birthed from the word of God. Mm -hmm. But if we get into the word of God, we will be radically different than the world. And if we get into the word of God, we will take pause and rest for God. If we get into the word of God, we will deal financially in a right way with God's work. Israel, they had to keep throwing the fruits in for God to get their attention. Oh no, that was the path. What's it going to take to get out? Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. Lord, that your word is true. God, the power of your word working. Lord, if we make any pledge at all today, a promise, an oath, a solemn promise before you, Lord, that is to hold your word lightly in our hearts and in our lives. Because from that pledge and that promise will come, Lord, that we would be different that we would be taking times of rest for you. And Lord, that we would deal uprightly before you in our giving. Lord, would you today challenge our hearts. Lord, as what you have begun in us, Lord, let it be stable, let it remain, let it hold fast in our lives. Give you honor and give you praise today in Jesus' name.